This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so I'm here to talk about some of the work that I've been doing, uh, trying to understand and map freezing tolerance and, and, and cold tolerance in uh, uh, trypsigum. And more specifically talk about some of the, the challenges that we've kind of been running into with uh, doing this mapping in a, in a heterozygous genome. And so to kind of motivate the whole thing, really in the end, what the, the whole goal is, is, to, is we'd like to be able to plant maize earlier, extend the growing season. Um, and to do that, we kind of need freezing tolerance. And the logic behind that is if we look at uh, Miscanthus's biomass accumulation relative to maize, so these plots on the right, um, uh, black is Miscanthus, white is maize. Uh, by the end of Miscanthus's growing season, it accumulates about 60% more biomass. Um, but the, the below plots showing the rates of accumulation of the two, they're pretty comparable. And so it seems like really the, the big dis difference there is that Miscanthus just starts its season earlier and ends it later. And so the thought is if we can replicate that in maize as well, we may be able to increase biomass there and that may translate to yield increases. And so trypsicum now matters because uh, it's a grass relative that uh, persists in a pretty wide latitudinal, latitudinal range exposed to a lot of different environmental conditions. So really warm environments and environments where it gets really cold. It's also a perennial, so it must be exhibiting some kind of freezing tolerance since, that it, sur since it survives winters. And then also it's a very close relative of maize having diverged only about a half million years ago, and it shares a whole genome duplication event. Um, and so to kind of try to uh, uh, approach understanding and mapping this freezing tolerance, um, Denise Kostich and Nick Lepec in the lab put together this mapping population that consists of a number of families that are northern by southern Tripscombe crosses. Uh, uh, those F1s from those crosses were all planted in a field together and open pollinated, and seed was collected from, from those F1s for uh, further screens. And so then Christy Galt, uh, a former lab member, um, went ahead and took that seed that was collected from those F1s, uh, germinated them to seedlings, exposed them to freezing conditions, uh, visually phenotyped for tolerance and susceptibility, and then uh, uh, those bulks, uh, tolerant and susceptible, were uh, pooled together, DNA extracted. And then furthermore, uh, we also did uh, some uh, Illumina whole genome sequencing for all of those founders uh, for that population, all of the F1s, and then each one of those pooled bulks. And so from there, <clears throat> uh, now we have a lot of uh, sequencing data that, that should represent the, the genetics of of this population, and we want to actually do some mapping. And so initially, there were some attempts to do this mapping uh, using the maze reference genome uh, uh, as, the, as the reference to, to map two. Uh, this didn't work mostly, uh, be, well, because the two genomes are just uh, very, uh, uh, have differences in, in their architecture. So maze has 10 chromosomes, Tripscombe has 18. So there's a lot of issues with just contiguity there. And then also, there's always the possibility that whatever genes are in Tripscombe that are contributing to freezing tolerance just aren't in maize. And so there's a few different aspects uh, 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 that could be benefited by just using a Tripscombe reference genome to map to. And so through the Pan Ant project, there was sampling of a couple Tripscombe, uh, 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 of the Tripscombe founders, uh, and those were sequenced with PacBio HiFi. Uh, and, and I tried mapping using those genomes, uh, and that didn't work, uh, but uh, it worked, didn't work for a different reason this time, thankfully. Um, and so the, the issue in this case is that the, the genomes are really good. So uh, since this was sequenced with PacBio HiFi, you get really long, really high, accurate reads. Uh, the assemblers are actually able to put together these heterozygous regions and, and capture all the haplotypes that are, or all the alleles that are present in that genome, in that individual. And so those are kind of handled in two different ways during assembly. Um, in one instance, you can have just one main haplotype that kind of goes across. Uh, um, and then any like heterozygous regions will kind of be bowled off into these smaller scaffolds. And in this case, it's really easy to get to a, 
a single haplotype because you can just filter by uh, size of the sequence. Um, but then the other situation, which seems to be the one that we're kind of running into here, or that I'm running into, is that um, you get like pretty much full representation of both haplotypes. Um, homozygous regions are represented in both scaffolds. And so just using something like uh, scaffold size isn't really a good metric to, to, to filter out haplotypes. And like, maybe you're thinking, okay, so you have all this allelic diversity that's in your reference genome. Why would that really be a problem? That seems like a good thing that you're capturing all these alleles. Uh, and the issue is, well, it is a great thing, but uh, for our purposes or my purpose, it, it makes things a lot more complicated in that what I'm trying to do is take reads that represent some uh, other individual, other trypsum, map them to this genome and identify variants in that genome. And uh, in the case where we have multiple alleles, like on the right here, what ends up happening is you get, re the reads will just map to whichever uh, uh, copy of that gene they're more similar to. And so the first issue is that you're splitting, you're like reducing your depth in half pretty much uh, for your sequencing. And so you have a lot less power to like, well, depending on how you handle it. Um, but the bigger issue is that you miss all these heterozygous calls. Um, so say the, uh, uh, for that site, the reference genome has uh, both copies uh, or has the same uh, uh, alleles as the individual that you're mapping to it. Um, you're gonna call that site as homozygous against in both of those uh, and on both of those scaffolds. And so then you you just don't get the headers, I guess, or the head calls. And that is kind of what I was seeing whenever I looked at the uh, uh, the heterozygosity rate uh, of these reads mapped to the reference genomes that I was working with. I I, I saw very low. Uh, uh, so all heterozygosity it was that, that was much lower than I anticipated. And so um, what I then need now is kind of a way to kind of distinguish things that are or sequences within these references that are allelic to one another um, uh, so that I can actually separate these haplotypes out of the genome. Um, and so the approach that I wanted to use was just to use sequence diversity. And so the way we can do that is we can take this genome, map it against itself, and then for each pair of uh, contigs or scaffolds that are aligning to each other, we can go across, uh, count the number of SNPs, count the number of aligned base pairs, and calculate the sequence divergence number from that, uh, just SNPs over aligned base pairs. And what you get is this really nice bimodal distribution where things with very low sequence divergence are allelic to one another. And then everything on the right side of this distribution are have homology to one another, but the sequence divergence is much higher. And that homology is more likely due to, to like past whole genome duplication events and things like that. And so if I just disregard everything on the right side of this distribution, just work with things that um, are showing low sequence divergence and I think are uh, allelic to one another, what I can then do, do is go across the genome and just arbitrarily kind of bin one of the two into uh, a haplotype one or a haplotype two. Uh, and then from there, uh, we can take this heterozygous genome and kind of like make a nice computational inbred just by removing one of those haplotypes. And so then I uh, can just do all of the read mapping and variant calling against this single haplotype and I should get an accurate representation of the alleles that are present in all the individuals in the population. And so really the whole thing is just to try to make this, uh, this process with working with TRIPSCHEM a little bit more analogous to maize so that we can apply a lot of these genetics and genomics methods that are already established and, uh, and work really well in maize to TRIPSCHEM, identify that freezing tolerance and then bring it back. Uh, and here's a little bit of evidence that we, we actually go outside occasionally, which is, uh, but, but really, I uh, just want to say thank you to all the people that have really contributed to this project. And thank you to all the people in the Buckler Lab, Michelle and Shinkai, postdocs in our lab have been really, really helpful. Uh, 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 and from Iowa State, Matt Hufford and Arun, they're responsible for assembling the, the reference genomes that, uh, that we now can actually do mapping with, which is awesome. And, uh, the Danforth Center, Elizabeth Kellogg and Taylor Abishan Elder, 
uh, did all the like sampling of uh, of the Andrew Pagonier from across the world uh, that, that have been sequenced. And uh, of course, my funding sources, committee members, and yeah, any questions? I so I went through like the entire process of mapping rates to the reference genome uh, and 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 trying to do uh, um, uh, better like resolution actual mapping with with those with that data, but um, uh, that's when I kind of ran into this issue where allele frequency distributions looked really strange, and and this was before I knew that we really weren't doing a proper job of separating out haplotypes from the reference. And so there was a lot of the genome that just had uh, uh, both alleles present. And so I was missing a lot of heterozygosity. And so it, when I say it didn't work, I mean, like there, there wasn't really anything interesting to see. So, so don't really have candidates, but this is kind of a recent development. We're kind of going back through the process now and then, but, but it, Okay, so the question was, did we see structural polymorphisms between the two haplotypes? Uh, and how did we pick which one to keep for, for uh, uh, mapping? So structural polymorphisms, yeah. So um, it's not gonna be easy to see from this. There, there is, yeah, there's a lot of like inversions. You'll see some deletions uh, between haplotypes, um, uh, but that didn't really go into a whole lot of, that wasn't, that wasn't very much, that wasn't considered really when, when like binning things into haplotype one or two. The only thing that was actually considered was the length of the, uh, the assembled scaffold. And so what I kept are just the longer of the two pairs, uh, just to try to, the idea trying to be that uh, it's possible like, hap, like haplotype or the longer one may have uh, some sequence that, uh, that's going to need to be represented in, in the, the, the final genome for mapping that isn't in haplotype two. So it's just the longer one of the two. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, instead of working with these heterozygous genomes, would it be easier to, to just uh, either make a TRIPS come inbred or, or find one that is? So uh, the cool thing is we we almost already do have one that is pretty inbred. It's, so there were three trypsomes that were sequenced. One of them uh, was strangely very inbred already, but there was still like portions of the genome that did have heterozygosity and were captured in the reference. Um, but it the process of making like the crosses um, is a little bit difficult, and that's kind of why we ended up with this uh, this structure where the F1s were open pollinated instead of made, making controlled like selfs. Sean Luke? <laughs> yeah, so the question was, okay, and make a computational reference that has degenerate base. So kind of like collapsing it and, and maintaining anything that was like deleted in one versus the other kind of thing here. Um, Are you, are you thinking kind of like practical haplotype graph kind of? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't really. I don't have a good idea for that. I guess. Um, but hmm, I think like the, the the like problem about the aligner not wanting to to like resolve through a high divergence region isn't necessarily an issue in this case, just because. Um, the way that I aligned these genomes was using anchor wave, which uh, will identify like large syntenic blocks and then do more refined base pair resolution alignment within those blocks. Um, and so I think, and then also like, I only really care about things that are low divergence in this case, uh, and we're still capturing things that are really high divergence. So, but yeah, it could still be in it. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Okay. Are there any questions on Zoom? Or... All right, cool. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.